Hello, everyone, and welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. Diverse and bold, with a long history stretching back hundreds of years, New York is reinventing itself as an epicenter of dynamic winemaking. The state is home to the first winery in the United States, and producers are drawing on that background to produce some of the most exciting wines in the country. In this eighth episode of the series, Boldly Finger Lakes, we take a deep dive into New York State's most well-known AVA and discover some of the unexpected. So before we introduce our panel, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During this Zoom webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants. We have a chat section and a Q&A section. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Uh, just be sure to select everyone in the two field as it can default to panelists only. And the Q&A section is that's where we would like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. Now for the panel. Men, uh, moderating today's panel is Jamie Good. Jamie Good is a London based wine writer, lecturer and judge. He is currently wine columnist with UK national newspaper, The Sunday Express, in addition to contributing regularly to a range of publications, including The World of Fine Wine, Noble Rot, Wine and Spirits in the USA, Wine Business International, Drinks International, Wines and Vines, and Vine Pair. He is also author of the book, Wine Science, which won the Glenn Fittich Award for Drinks Book in 2006. Jamie has a PhD in plant biology and worked as a book editor before joining the world of wine with his site, wineanorak.com, now one of the leading wine websites. He won the 2007 Glenn Fittich Wine Writer of the Year Award. Joining Jamie today are Megan Frank of Dr. Constantine Frank Winery. Megan is the fourth generation of the family to manage the winery in the Finger Lakes. She holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University and two postgraduate degrees, one in wine business from the University of Adelaide, Australia, and one in enology from Cornell University. She holds the WSET level four diploma in wine and spirits and is a certified wine judge through the American Wine Society, among other accolades. She joined the winery in 2013. Christopher Bates, a master sommelier of Element Winery, has spent over 25 years in all aspects of the hospitality industry, lending him a well-rounded perspective of all facets. Christopher and his wife, Isabel, own and operate Element Winery, among many other hospitality businesses in the Finger Lakes. In 2012, Christopher was named Best Young Sommelier in the World after winning Best Young Sommelier in America previously in the year and passed his Master Sommelier exam in May 2013. More recently, Christopher was included in Wine Enthusiast's Top 40 Under 40 Tastemakers list. And Oscar Bink of Herman J. Weimer Vineyard. Since 2007, Oscar and his business partner, winemaker Fred Merwarth, uh, founded uh, Herman J. Weimer and is now a 90 acre property with a commitment to viticulture, thought leadership and experimentation and is widely considered to be the standard bearer at the helm of the Finger Lakes Revolution. Before going to Weimar, Oscar, a Swedish agronomist who holds a Master of Science in Agriculture Economics and studied at Cornell University, worked in the wine business with distributors of Diageo and Moet Hennessy in New York City. So great panel today. Uh, let's get started. Over to you, Jamie. Hello everyone, I'm really looking forward to the session. Um, we've got some really cool people um, taking part and we've got some wines as well to try. And um, my role is to make sure that we, um, that, that I talk as little as possible and that we don't bore the audience. Um, Katie, have you got a map of the Finger Lake showing its location that you could put up on the screen? So before we get down to it, I just wanted to provide some geographical context for those who aren't familiar um, with the Finger Lakes. And, if, and for those who are very, very familiar with it, I apologize for this. Um, but you can see this is the, this is the, it doesn't look like the largest um, region in New York State, but in terms of the, the amount of wine produced, it's the most significant one. And um, in terms of its location, it's not all that far from Canada. 
Um, so Toronto isn't a, a million miles away. And there's also a major wine region um, in Niagara, um, which is kind of close. And like the Finger Lakes, um, benefits uh, and relies upon the presence of large bodies of water to moderate winter lows. And if we look at the Finger Lakes there, it's a pretty distinctive um, um, region with these, this range of lakes, some of which are quite deep. And um, it's a really interesting place to grow wine grapes. And so if we can take that one down, um, I'll begin the session by, I'll be firing a question across to Oscar actually, to start off with. Oscar, look, the Finger Lakes has a very distinctive climate. Um, so what are the challenges and limitations of growing wine grapes here? Uh, yes, uh, we have a little special climate. I mean, one basic thing is that we are uh, rather cold. Uh, we are far north and inland. So we get uh, bitter cold winters. Uh, that is one of the challenges uh, that leads to a um, more limited amount of varieties that you can grow that are cold hardy. Uh, so that's one main challenge on the selection of varieties that we can have. The other one would be then uh, uh, potential moisture uh, that we have opposite problems at some of the drier wine regions in the world. So then moisture and, uh, and, and cold winters are main challenges. And that for, that's why you will see, again, going, going back to the agricultural viability of each site is then very related to the deep lakes. And the deep lakes are what's moderating the areas to keep the vines cold or warm in the winter, but also help us to maybe mitigate some of the danger we have for spring frost, which we are looking into might be one of the challenges this year. We have a very, very warm spring and we're ahead of the game. So we're all a little nervous now, what's gonna happen when uh, that, that frost might come in May. So that's, that's one of the main challenges I would say that we're dealing with. But again, going back to the lakes and the weather patterns and the air movement from the lakes is then trying to mitigate that. Well, there's an interesting uh, matrix of climatic variables then presumably in some many wine regions, you don't have this, this, this same factors. So I guess it's almost like the proximity to the lake and the, the way that you face um, the aspect is, is more critical perhaps in, um, in your region than it might be in many other regions. Um, yes, obviously, the, the, it's quite fascinating. We have some vineyards both on the east side and the west side of the lake. And you can tell, you know, if you're just one mile close from the lake, one mile up, you can grow, uh, you know, vinifera. Uh, easily or easier uh, and then you just go a little bit up the hill and they won't survive the winter so the relationship there to the lake is is absolutely key when it comes to them then with the slopes if you put it that way obviously where you have more if you have more slope you have more speed in the air drainage and the regular drainage so that helps also absolutely um, we are uh, the the sun is traveling rather high up in the sky here. You know, the latitudes are still not up in, you know, we're not up in Canada. We're looking at uh, Northern Italy and, and, and France here. So the sun is traveling pretty high on the sky. So the angles towards the sun might not be as much of important as for example, Northern Germany, if you put it that way. But definitely uh, the slopes towards the lake will and I think if you talk to Megan, I think that's some of their advantages, which is on a cooler, cooler lake, if you put it that way, but because of the slopes that, that mitigates that. Um, so Christopher, um, I see you're sitting outside, um, but the, the, the leaves aren't really on the trees yet or, at all. So, so it shows you that <laughs> things are starting up quite a bit later there than for instance, even in Northern Europe here. But the question I had for you was, you know, we're talking, we've just been talking a little bit about some of the challenges that we're faced with in the Finger Lakes in terms of viticulture. But I guess a more interesting question is, is you know, what positives do you have from the physical characteristics of the region, including, I guess, the soils as well? I mean, it's, it, it, it seems a bit negative to focus on, oh, we're trying to grow grapes here, but it's really, really hard because it's really cold winters and 
you know, the vines don't survive. But there must be a good reason for growing wine grapes in this region. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, the good reasons are our winters are super cold, so everything dies, and then we have huge disease. Pro- oh, no, never mind. Those aren't the advantages, are they? Uh, the advantages are, <clears throat> so here's the thing. Like, people, I think, oftentimes talk about the Finger Lakes in a, in a, in a way that maybe, like, we hear words and we think something that might not be true. So like we talk about this as a cool or a cold climate growing region. And there's aspects of that that are true, but I'm not sure that they always trigger the right stereotypes or perceptions as to what we actually deal with. So like Oscar was talking about, we're cold region, which means that we have really hard winter problems. And like vinifera struggles sometimes when it hits negative five, negative 10, negative more uh, sometimes, but, when we talk about it being a cool climate, mostly what people think about is, oh, fruit struggles to ripen in this place. And that, you know, you're really struggling for ripeness. And that's kind of actually sort of contradictory in my experience. It's, you, you talked about like the delay, like we don't have leaves on the trees. We don't have bud break yet. I mean, Oscar, Megan, when do you get, you, we're worried about bud break happening early this year, but that really still means like May 1st, right? We're not worried about it happening in February. We're not worried about it happening in March. We're not even really talking about it happening late April, right? That's right. So yeah. we, we're, we're talking about exactly. early bud break means it's not May 10th. Maybe it's May 3rd. Maybe it's May 1st, depending on variety and site. So we have a really late, late start to the season. You know, I, Obviously, we all watched and saw what happened in Burgundy this morning and in Champagne uh, the last couple of days. They've already had bud break. I've been watching Oregon go through bud break. Napa's been through bud break for a while now. And we still have another month of dormancy, pretty much. So we have a late start to the season. We also have a really defined end to our season. And when August, or sorry, God, I hope it's not August, when October 15th comes or somewhere around there, it's pretty much done for us. We don't have that ability to continue to have dry, sunny, ripening weather into November usually. If anything, we have, we're just trying to dehydrate at that point, really. Um, so we have the short growing season. But I think what's oftentimes maybe misunderstood is how efficient that growing season is. Because from May 15th to October 15th, pretty much every single day is between 60 degrees and 80 degrees. We have constant rain. Sorry, not constant rain. We have regular rainfall. So we never are going up into the hundreds where our vines shut down from heat stress. We're almost never going into hydric stress. So when we talk about a lot of wine regions that have longer growing seasons, they need it. Because half of their summer, vines are shut down and not ripening at all. But pretty much every day from May 15th here till October 15th, we're just ticking along on that ripeness scale and it continues to grow. So for me, that's actually one of the most exciting things that I see because my experience is is that I'm seeing, I see a lot of um, uh, like fruit ripeness without an incredible amount of structural or without the same speed of structural ripeness. So in the Finger Lakes, my experience is seeing ripe fruit at low alcohols, at higher acids, at lower pHs, and all of those kind of things that to me make our wine super interesting and exciting. So I think that's my, that's my exciting part of the Finger Lakes. Yeah, I really like this idea of being able to get whatever you want to term it, physiological ripeness or flavor ripeness um, at you know, modest alcohol levels and with good natural acidity. I mean, really is for fine wine making, it's a, it's a sort of holy grail, isn't it? It's something that you really want. And, oh. and, and if, if you can do that without having to, you know, because often I think many wine regions with certain varieties is a compromise in terms of picking. It's like, do we pick early and lose flavor to have natural acidity or do we pick late to get the flavor and then have to deal with um, high bricks, um, fermentation struggles, and necessary of correcting acid, you know, so that's, it's a very interesting position to be in. And delightfully, I think we have a perfect example of that, because like Gewürztraminer for me is one of those grapes that like pops into my brain about that of like, when it starts to taste like something, the structure usually goes 
wonky. But, well, I'll let Oscar talk about that, obviously, later. We shall, we shall talk about that in a moment. But I think we should, should we, Megan, we should go, come to you. I, I know I've um, neglected you so far, but the, the, we have um, first no wine. No worries. <laughs> the Constantin Frank Blanc de Blanc 2016. And I think this is really interesting because it's a good place to start because if we look at the history Ooh. of the <laughs> um, sparkling wine was very, very important um, back in the day, um, presumably with, um, with the, 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 it was the Great Western, wasn't it? With a massive production of sparkling wine. And this is when Eastern USA was probably as, equally as big or bigger um, than California. California got going a bit later. And so I think that's a really interesting point. So, so really, yeah, well, we'll talk about sparkling, but also can you say something, you know, let's backtrack a little bit about the history of the Finger Lakes, because um, your family has been quite important in shaping the modern um, Finger Lakes um, wine industry. Absolutely, Jamie. Yeah, certainly sparkling wine is, is definitely part of our story. And we're talking, you know, mid 1800s in the 1860s. Uh, there was production here of the American varieties, you know, Concord, Catawba, Niagara, uh, a lot of immigrants coming to New York, uh, planting vines from the, their homeland. And there were many attempts at vinifera, but uh, they just did not survive, unfortunately. Um, and, but the American varieties thrived and then the French American hybrids began to emerge, you know, post, post uh, prohibition. Um, my great grandfather, Constantine, came here in 1951 and was really perplexed why there was no vinifera. You know, he saw some really large production wineries. Uh, there are actually 12 very large, um, large wineries focusing on more sweeter bulk, bulk production. And uh, he really saw potential, you know, with vinifera. And he had, you know, 30 plus years of experience in Ukraine. He had earned a PhD in viticulture, and uh, he was very confident that, you know, the European varieties could thrive. So uh, he began with a short stint at a neighboring winery, Gold Seal, which is just down the road from us, um, planting Riesling, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. And this was in 1953, and they, have a, they had a devastatingly cold winter in 1954. Um, and actually a lot of the Concord buds did not survive, but the Riesling, the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir uh, were, were all okay. So that was really the, the proof that, that he needed. And researchers believed it was due to the cold, but in actuality, you know, it was due to phylloxera. And Constantine's research, you know, he had dealt with phylloxera in Eastern Europe. He brought, you know, that technique of grafting with him and that was successful. So he basically started um, his own experiment station because there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, belief that vinifera could sur survive and thrive. It was more seen as sort of an experiment. And, uh, you know, the region grew from there. There were a lot of people that worked in the vineyard, worked in the winery, took those grafting techniques back to their, their wineries in their home states. Um, so certainly Riesling has always been sort of in the forefront of our story as a region. And today, you know, we have over 150 wineries producing fantastic wines in the Finger Lakes. Um, and we have, you know, wonderful glacial soils, as Oscar and, and Chris were mentioning, very deep glacial lakes. Um, and all of this contributes to, to kind of how vinifera is, is possible um, in, in our region. So very much that moderating. So this is a photo of a large chunk of shale that we have. So the western side of Cuca Lake, which is where we're located, is a very acidic, uh, high composition of shale. Um, and a few times during the season, I have to actually have to go in and, and pick up the largest rocks because they can get caught in the uh, machinery. So lots of shale. We don't irrigate as well. So, you know, you have deeper kind of penetration of, of the root system. Uh, and all of our posts here, which is kind of interesting, the vineyard posts have to be wood on this side of Cuca because the shale is so difficult to <laughs> try to put in a metal post that uh, the wood is a little bit more forgiving. Um, so there are some challenges, you know, with the glacial soils, but what they contribute, you know, into the final wine certainly makes it worthwhile. Could you say something about lake effect? And also, you know, if you're going to grow vinifera, um, 
do you have to be particularly careful about where you're putting the vinifera? Certainly, yes. No, that is very important. I think uh, proximity to the lake is really crucial. You know, you can imagine, you know, Cuca is nearly 200 feet deep, Seneca over 600, uh, Cayuga 400 feet deep, over 400. So incredibly important uh, to have a site selection that um, is going to allow you to capitalize on that moderating effect. And with Cuca in particular, um, as Oscar was mentioning, the uh, slopes are very steep here. So uh, that kind of elevation and that air circulation down to the lake and then hitting that warm lake, particularly in the winter, and then having that airflow circulate back up is really the reason why vinifera is, is possible here um, because it does get, get quite cold. So back to the wine, tell us a little bit about your Blanc de Blanc. Sure, absolutely. So uh, this is our 2016 Blanc de Blanc. So 100% Chardonnay. Uh, this one, um, we've been producing sparkling wine since 1985. Um, sparkling wine was not something my great grandfather was interested in producing. Uh, he used to say that the only reason the French make champagne is because they can't make a de decent table wine that far north, which is a, kind of an awful thing to say. Um, but his son, Willie, did not agree and felt that sparkling wine was um, really demanded, uh, you know, attention. So this one is 100% Chardonnay. We also work with Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier um, with our sparkling cuvées. Uh, this is a photo of, of the cellar, which I'm currently sitting in. It looks very dark, um, but Christopher, I'm in the same region as, as uh, Christopher and Oscar, and it is a beautiful day outside. Um, but 100% Chardonnay, this is aged for a minimum four years on the leaves before it's disgorged. Um, we disgorged throughout the year. Our sparkling winemaker, Eric Bauman, has been here over 17 years. And uh, it seems that, you know, we're harvesting typically uh, beginning of September is pretty common, but it has been as early as mid-August. Uh, so we're, we're going to see how that kind of progresses. Um, but um, this one, you know, just has a tiny bit of um, barrel uh, primary fermentation. The rest is in stainless steel. And then, uh, as I mentioned, four years minimum on the leaves before it's disgorged. For those that have the wine, the disgorgement month and year is on the back, um, which is kind of handy. And then uh, the dosage, we use a different dosage wine for every uh, vintage that we release. So this dosage was um, actually a Dr. Frank Chardonnay, uh, a still Chardonnay from 2018 to kind of help um, build that complexity. Uh, the dosage is at eight grams per liter residual. Uh, so nice kind of balance there. And uh, I, it's personally one of my favorite sparklings that we produce. So. I'm excited to share this with you all. I'm really impressed. I love it. It's beautiful precision. It's very pure. Got a nice acid line. Wonderful. I think this is um, I mean this this is a region that presumably could be making quite a lot of good sparkling. Is it something that's coming? Is is it something that's returning? And um, and Christopher, you're nodding. Is is this something you see as a part of the future of the Finger Lakes? Yeah, most definitely. I think some of the most exciting wines I've seen over the last couple of years have been sparkling wines from the area. Um, and they're as, as I think producers take them more and more seriously and really gear up towards um, both traditional method, but also taking the time necessary. I think we're seeing some really beautifully elegant, delicate, balanced sparkling wines here. Yeah. Um, Cause this is, this is four and a half years on its lees, um, which is quite an investment in terms of, you know, you know, once you start keeping a wine four and a half years in its lees, you've got a lot of bottles tied up, you know, so it's, uh, it takes, takes some commitment. And Oscar, you, do you make, um, do you make sparkling as well? We do. Uh, again, may, back to both Megan's and, and Christopher's notes here, we also have committed to sparkling quite a lot lately over the last 15, 20 years. And it does um, a couple of reasons why uh, they are turning out rather nicely. <laughs> so that's, that's one reason. But it's also um, then as the region is growing 
uh, more tourism resources. We have resources being it both time and warehousing and sellers that as you're saying, Megan, you mentioned your age is for 40 months and ours also up there in the 30, 35 months aging. So it's a sign of, of, of an evolving region where we actually have time and uh, uh, energy, we put energy towards it. So very much so. The other aspect is, you know, going back to this cooler region or we're saying when we said cooler, cold, damn cold in the winter, but uh, good growing condition in the summer, we still tame tend to retain them some nice acidity, some freshness in our grapes, some delicate wines, which we are gonna talk about here later on. So it lends itself very nicely to sparkling wine. And uh, back to Bates' comment on how, when do we pick and how do we pick? It's, it's a, how do we mitigate? It's a management for harvest. Uh, you, these Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes that you're picking early, it then makes you not need to pick all the Chardonnay and Pinot later on also. So it's a time management also lends itself to making sparkling wines. So that's, and, that's boring, but important. <laughs> I also want to throw in, you know, I, and, I, and I didn't mean to say that it's just starting now that we're making really good sparkling wine. I think one of the coolest tastings I've done in a really long time was actually with Megan uh, and tasting um, sparkling Dr. Frank and Glenora wines what, we went back to the 70s, I think, in that tasting. And just every every vintage we, we went did. further back, the wines mm -hmm. got fresher and younger and just it was they were mind blowing. It was really impressive. So it's not a it's not only a new thing. Like there's No, no, the, and also the sparkling culture has been here for many, many, many years, right? That it goes even hundred. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. So we're talking about vinifera sparkling wine while sparkling wine with other varieties has been going on forever here. So. I like that term, sparkling culture. I think that's a great yeah. way to describe us. Added something in our vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's one other aspect that, that I guess we could raise now, because um, as a region, the Finger Lakes is pretty diverse in terms of um, the great varieties and the great material that's available, because there's still quite a lot of, of, of natives and hybrids, and also the modern hybrids as well being grown in the region. And I think in the past, I think there's, there's been some negativity towards non vinifera and you three all work as far as I know, exclusively with vinifera, but there's what's what I find very interesting is this idea that with the rise of the natural wine movement, you've got people going out there and doing interesting things with great varieties that people previously thought were flawed. Um, like, um, the Labruscas, you know, people think, well, they've got flavors that are abnormal, um, that don't fit into our current concept of fine wine. And then you have people going out there and making wines quite naturally um, or in a different way and suddenly discovering that you can make something that's really by any standard is, would count in as something as a fine wine or an interesting wine and that there's potentially a market for. And I think it'd be really interesting for the region to, to not just relegate the, the hybrids and the, the natives to, to cheap sweet wines for unsophisticated people who rock up in the region at the weekend, but to actually start doing things that are really interesting with them. And I'm thinking about, you know, the, the move towards pet gnats and things like that. Because when you, because sparkling is interesting here, because when you're making sparkling, you're picking grapes early. And, and I think once you start picking these varieties a little bit earlier, um, and making wines in interesting ways. You've got like the Chepica project, you know, um, that Nathan Kendall and Pascaline Le Peltier have done. And they're with very old varieties like Delaware and I think the other one was Catawba. Um, and they've managed to find a really interesting traction in the market. I know this is a very long rambling question, but do you think there might be a place for um, these varieties, not just making sort of sweet sort of wines for people who don't like dry wines? Uh, I mean, I I am probably not the right person to answer this. I'm going to say a few things. I'm going to hand it over to Bates. <laughs> but but I think you're covering a lot of different topics here. I think you're talking natural wine. That's a that's a thing itself. And then maybe that's a trend. And then you have what varieties are fun is a good agriculturally here. And then you have yes, you talk about picking early, and then maybe the 
variety characters are not as dominant when you pick early. So you can make sparkling wines that are not in the flavors that you are referring to potentially the per person who drives up here on weekends like. I mean, we're hitting a lot of things here. So Bates, do you have anything to say about this? <laughs> yeah, so I, I've spent many, many years like philosophizing about this idea and, and, and thinking about it. Um, and I guess, you know, for somebody who grew up here and grew up tasting the wines that were made here in the 80s and the 90s, um, and grew up drinking a lot of really shitty native wines um, and hybrid wines. I think that left, I think for many of us, that's left a really bad taste literally in our mouths for a really long time. Um, but that being said, the same people who make nasty native and hybrid wines also make nasty vinifera wines. And that never really stopped us from believing that that was possible. So I think we're also in this kind of funny time period where like so many of us have been fighting against the odds for so long to change the opinion and the stereotype of what's possible here and to convince ourselves, each other and the world that Vinifera has a real solid home here that I think that there's a little hesitancy, I think from some of us to really kind of dive into that. That being said, as Oscar said, and if you, as you pointed out, I mean, there's some really significant advantages to growing these over vinifera in some cases and some of them grow significantly easier now i i know the folk on this call and and, and really understand this but i think that it's important to remember that there's that we have two different ideas growing fruit and growing wine and you know for very many years we've always been farmers here and we've always talked about growing fruit and the ease of growing fruit. Now, I know as farmers, we want fruit to grow easily. As growing wine though, I think it's really important to remember that in most of the world where wine grows really easily, I'm not super excited about drinking it. I doubt many people on this call are really excited. You know, I'm gonna fight about Pinot Noir later with everybody and, and uh, you know, the reality is it sucks to grow Pinot Noir here. It sucks to grow Pinot Noir everywhere that Pinot Noir is good. So, I don't know, I think there's a big balance to it. Probably didn't answer your question at all. No, that's great, because I think also we, we have to be respectful of the, the marketplace and the fact that there is a market for wines that are of styles that maybe, you know, I don't appreciate. You know, there's a place for everybody and it's a diverse region and, and everyone has to coexist together and work together. Um, but I guess what we're trying to focus on now is what we'd call fine wine, wines that are uh, they're exportable, that are world class, that people you could put in front of wine lovers from anywhere in the world and say, try these because these are really interesting. It's, they're not really interesting despite they're really interesting, you know, first up. You know, that we, these, are, these are wines that we should take seriously and that belong in the peer group of the world's great wines. And that's what I think is exciting about the region is that I've trying wines and I'm thinking, um, so like, um, when I was out last, which is now a year and a half ago, Bates. Um, did a little tasting at his at his gaff where it was a blind tasting where he paired one of his element wines with like not just a good example of the same variety from around the world but like a world class example. So like his Syrah was next to um, Jamais Cote Roti and his Cabernet Franc was next to Clos Rougeard. And you know a few of us did this tasting totally blind. We didn't know what we were tasting. And sorry about that. I know it was a little rude. And and when we, you know, we, you know, and I like this. I think it's good if it's professionals. We should put our, our, our we should put our, um, you know, we should, we should be prepared to, to do these blind tastings and say what we think and not try and hide, you know, because we can often hide. And I think it's, it's good to be honest with ourselves as well. And I came out of that tasting thinking, there's no doubt that some of the wines, I preferred the Finger Lakes version to the established classic, you know, and that's, you know, that's, you know, this is this is um, indisputable. You know, it's when you do it blind. You, you you know, you're being really honest with yourself. So I think now, though, we should move to the next wine, which is the Weimar Gewurztraminer Dry 2019. Oscar, yes. So um, let's see here. I I think uh, just to talk a little bit about. Uh, let's go back a little bit of what, what Bates was saying here. 
I think you would have what he might have mentioned, you know, he talked to Herman Weimer himself, you know, he was a German, slightly on the grumpy side and stubborn, <laughs> grumpy bastard, you know, and he's gone again, you know, swimming upstream here to establish Vinifra together with, for example, Dr. Frank. Um, I think now when you're going into another generation, we're in a little bit more open-mindedness and like, hey, let's see what works. Let's let's figure this out. And back to, to your comment there, it's a little sometimes difficult to just follow trends that goes fly go back and forth. So we have to kind of establish this a little little slower. So that's why you see, but you see a little bit more of a welcoming open mindedness in the region now with all kinds of varieties. And I say that from being the most vinifera driven, one of the most vinifera driven variety wineries in the region. So, but anyway, that being said, Gewurztraminer, we touched on it a little bit already. A little cooler growing season, but not necessarily then not worried about ripeness. And I'm going to add a little bit to what Bates said. Uh, I actually feel that some vintages we have a rather long growing season. Should we hit these wonderful September and October months being it sunny? Um, again, because we are on the edge on what's... Uh, possible to grow, but we're also in a region which have very varied seasons. So one vintage is very different from the other vintage. We are then making somewhat different styles of wine or we're working with the different, different vintages. So what we have done here with Gewürztraminer, which is a rather kind of prone to get boritis rather early. And then imagine going to other Gewürztraminer regions around the world, we often compare us to Northern Italy more than maybe Alsace. So we tend to go in and actually pick this a little earlier, capture acidity, and then enjoy these lower alcohol wines. These, these, uh, these vines, some of them are from the early 70s and from the early 70s into the 90s. So it's rather rather old vines that we tend to feel that we get some oomph and weight to them anyway, even if we're trying to get this acidity. So, so you won't get the perception of dryness in this wine, doesn't only derive from the lack of residual sugar, it's also nice acidity to it. And I think we also have this conversation rather often where you compare to I don't, I don't want to generalize, but an Alsatian one where you have really warm, hot, you know, Gewürztraminer as a grape tend to ripen rather fast and it gets the sugar level spikes, but the acidity tends to drop equally fast. So when you go to a region that is much warmer uh, or where you don't capture the acidity early, you tend to have a sugar that it converts into alcohol to get a perception of dryness in this one, you need to ferment it rather dry. And then the alcohol comes up in 14, 15 in order to, because you don't have acidity to play with. And that's where we, it's not only then Gewürztraminer, but it also comes with our Pinots and our Riesling. We have the advantage to balance this out a little bit. And you make this Gewürztraminer for you who taste it now, it tend to be a rather fresh presentation of a Gewürztraminer which also makes them rather ageable. So these wines, they age rather nicely. Um, so because we have the uh, option to pick in section, we pick uh, everything by hand at Weimar, we tend to then capture different nuances through harvest, depending on what the, the weather is giving us. You know, if we have sunny weather, we have more options and when it rains, we don't have the options. So, um, this 19 vintage was a gorgeous vintage, not based that it was a warm season. It was actually quite cold, but the fall was wonderful. The fall was September, October. It gave us the option to, to be rather strategic in our picking. And so this is then whole cluster uh, and fermented on indigenous yeast. And that could be a separate conversation, but tend to have a little slower slower fermentation in these wines, which gives a little bit more texture. Uh, we have fermentation up to six to seven months on these wines. So you still get texture, but a freshness to it. 
Yeah, I'm really impressed with this. This is for 25 bucks. This is an incredible wine. It's yes. because Gucci. I think Gavos Tremon is like one of these varieties that, that you know, they, they call it a four by four wine. So when you do the analysis, it's pH four and four grams a liter of tartaric, uh, sorry, of, of <laughs> titratable acidity. Um, and, and so to, when you're dealing with that sort of analysis, you need the phenolics to give mm. the freshness. And, but then you're really running a, a risk with Britannomyces, which you don't often get in, in white wines, but when you've got a pH four, it's, it's interesting. Cause I think a lot of Gravertz Tremoners do have that sort of phenolic Brit Bretty character that adds, some people find it attractive. I know a New Zealand winemaker actually inoculated with Britannomyces, one of his Gravertz Tremoners. But I think what's nice about this is you've got the full flavor but you've got freshness and precision as well. And I think that's that's rare, I think, to get this sort of all the characters of Gravitz Tramina, but still with a, a, a brightness. And, and it doesn't feel compressed. It doesn't feel like you've picked too early and you've lost the flavor character um, to try and get the acid. It, so it, this is then, this specific wine is picked uh, over almost uh, one full month to capture different sex. So you get in and get this acidity from our cooler sites and then try to get some ripeness and then balance that out. We also do not let it sit on, not, not a Gewürztraminer wine winemaking, let it sit on the skins a little, you know, for 24 hours. We tend to be a little careful with that here. Yeah. And that derives culturally, going back to Northern Italy, where you have disease pressure and you're, you might have botrytis, you don't want it to sit on the skins, right? So you're, it's a, a thing that you're careful. So you have to have to be very considerate in your phenolic ripeness and make sure the grape are perfect ripeness wise, because you can't rely on the flavors necessary from the skin as much. Yeah, yeah. So then Megan, I mean, the you, delicacy and the precision comes in there. Megan, do you grow any Gewurz Tremina? We do, yeah. It's actually one of my favorite varieties. Um, but I think, you know, speaking about Alto Adige in Northern Italy, it's a really interesting comparison. Um, I actually have a good friend from grad school um, from Alto Adige, and we did a dual seminar together with a few of our wines. Um, and uh, there's so many places also with showers, like they have like 300 days of sun, <laughs> which is crazy. We have like 165 here in the Finger Lake. So there's tremendous, um, tremendous differences. But I think to Oscar's point, the freshness and the acidity and the liveliness is a, is a real sort of, you know, characteristic difference uh, that you find sort of across the board with Gewürz Streaminer. Uh, we take a little bit of a different approach in the winemaking uh, where we do typically 24 hours, sometimes as many as 48 hours of a cold soak. So we'll go through our must chiller, make sure it's really cold, do a cold soak on the skins. And that's just sort of been our, uh, one of the things we've just sort of always done to sort of capture, you know, the, the delicate, you know, aromatics that are just really close to the skins. Um, but there's certainly a wide variety of, uh, you know, why making decisions with Gilbert Schumacher because it is, as you're speaking, Jamie, so important um, with the phenolics and to really capture that aromatic potential, but still have that fresh acidity. So I think Gilbert Schumacher is a phenomenal variety for the region. And, um, you know, we're starting to see a lot more interest in it, which is really wonderful. And you have some Catatelli, yes? Which is... Uh... We do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, our Catsatelli, that's um, Georgian variety, but uh, because it was found in Ukraine where my great grandfather was originally grew up, uh, he was familiar with the variety and planted it uh, originally in 1958 on our site. And it's sort of become like a cult favorite, you know, in, in the region, but um, we're starting to expand plantings. And I think the hardest thing with our Catsatelli, it has a really bright future. The problem is the name. You know, it's a very intimidating name to look at with the R and the K, you know, uh, so we just shorten it R cats. But uh, especially with the emergence of the Georgian wine, you know, movement, uh, the wines are much more common uh, in the marketplace today. I think that's certainly helping us. Um, and I know Weimar also does Separavi. We do Separavi as well. So uh, these varieties, you know, they're cold hardy particularly with our Catsatelli, it has very thick skin and it's a very loose cluster. So perfect for addressing 
the issues that Christopher was mentioning with, you know, disease pressure, moisture issues. Um, so it, it, it really is a phenomenal variety for our region. It's just, we have to get it in more people's glasses and, you know, really uh, educate about the variety. So um, let's move on to the, the third wine. Um, this is yours, Christopher, the beautifully packaged Element Pinot Noir 2015. With, I just love the wax bubble on the end. I, I, I'm a big fan of wax. I'll pay more money for a wine that's got a wax seal, definitely. That's what I'm counting on. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think, I don't know. We, the Finger Lakes for me is a, is a place that has so much potential because we have, you know, I think we've established ourselves with a reputation for Riesling, well-deserved. I think our Rieslings are phenomenal. And... Um, super, super uh, exciting. And I think that they stand in really kind of shoulder to shoulder in the wine world um, quite well. Um, but I think part of one of the challenge that, or part of what I find exciting about working here is the fact that for many, many years, Riesling has been the go-to for everybody because not only does it make great wine, but it's also relatively easy to grow. And especially going back to that farmer mentality of growing fruit versus growing wine, Riesling is much easier to grow than say Gewurztraminer, right, Oscar? I mean, is that is that a, that's a true now, statement. Now, now, I'm not saying nothing is easy, my friend. So. Nothing is easy, <laughs> but like but no, 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 yeah, in relative right? terms, I mean, we do, we do have, uh, the Gewurz, I mean, why we not have so many acreage? It's, it's, it's challenging. Like maybe Pinot, where you're getting at here also. It struggles with cold, yeah? Like it struggles with our winter more than Riesling does or Cab Franc does. Correct. It's not as cold hardy Gewurz, I mean, and it's a finicky as a variety itself. It's also closer, closer clusters. So we, we uh, tend to cluster. So that's why there's another challenge to it. So when we talk about like the challenges with these, I think historically a lot of any grape that had or offered it one of these challenges was oftentimes just sort of overlooked and passed on because you could plant something easier. Well, I think the reality is, is as we start to move from growing fruit to growing wine, as we start to think about not just the ease of how it grows and how much tons and what, how many bricks you get, but what the possible quality potential is of that fruit and where it can stand in the world of wine, I think that's when we start to see a lot more opportunity here for other grapes. And, you know, Oscar was talking earlier, Megan was talking earlier, we've, we, we talk about the lake effect and its importance, but I think we oftentimes, again, maybe make a, a, a misassumption sometimes because we talk about the lake effect for its importance during our winters, right? Because it helps to keep the grapes that are closer to the lake, so down towards the bottom of the slope, it helps to keep those areas warmer because that giant body of water isn't freezing typically. I mean, Cuca will freeze over solidly, Cayuga will freeze over solidly, Seneca won't. So um, Seneca Lake is always above 32 degrees at the surface. And therefore, as you get close to that lake, during the winter, those areas tend to stay warmer than the hilltops and certainly the slopes away from the lake. So Oscar was talking about, you know, the difference of a mile. One of the greatest ways to learn about the Finger Lakes is literally just to drive around and look at where vineyards are planted here because you're, you'll be going, as you drive away from the lake, you'll crest a hill. And as soon as you get to like this part of the hill, vinifera stops and it turns into hybrids and natives because you have to have the impact of that lake to be able to sort of temper that winter. But that same tempering effect happens in opposite in the summer. And it also is one of the great advantages that we have for our um, bud break, because in the spring right now, I'm sitting outside up on the hill on a beautiful, warm, sunny day. But if I had a lake house and I was sitting out by the lake right now, it would be probably 15 degrees colder than where I'm sitting a mile away at the moment. And what that means is that those areas that are close to the lake are also protected from their, from their bud, from breaking, bud breaking too early. Well, in the summer, the same thing happens with cooling down those warmer temperatures. And I know this conversation, I think Oscar and I had years ago talking about, I think when you guys were dealing with standing stone and like the difference of where things can be planted close to the lake and further from the lake, because you need to be close to the lake for your sensitive, winter sensitive varieties. You need to be further from the lake for things that need more warmth to ripen. 
And so, because you get just more warmth up on the hillsides than you do right next to the lake. So I guess my point of this long ramble is what that does is it creates an incredible amount of microclimates. And we forget, you know, people ask me, because I'm not going to talk about this wine at all. I like Pinot Noir. I think Pinot Noir does awesome here. I think it's really delicious. Um, I'm also obsessed with Syrah and slightly obsessed with Grenache here in the region. Well, how is it possible that we can be talking about one region that's producing killer world-class sparkling wine and I also think has the potential to grow Grenache? Because we're talking about an amazingly vast area. The Finger Lakes is 90 miles east to west, 60 miles north to south. You overlay that over France and like it covers half of France. Um, you also have to remember that because of these slopes, because of these lakes, because of the distance above and below or closer and further away from that lake, we have an incredible amount of microclimates that's creating a ton of opportunity for different grapes. So yeah, there's places that grow sparkling. There's places that are growing killer Riesling. There's also places that can ripen Syrah and Grenache super effectively. And that all lives in this really complex little region. So for oh, can me, I interject for a second? Um, yes. So, so great speech. I love it. Um, You're talking too much, mates. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, no. What I'm, I'm thinking is that from what you're saying, it sounds like to me that there probably are lots of really great sites that either aren't planted with the right varieties or aren't being treated with the care and the winemaking sensitivity that they deserve. So what that makes me think is from the, the, the some of the wines I've tasted from the region is that there's a massive potential that is partially fulfilled at the moment. But if there's the interest sort of like from the export market and also from the domestic market, you know, because people are um, drinking fine wine in New York City, maybe you're not thinking, let's drink something from New York State, you know, then they're splashing proper money. And um, so, you know, it's not like it's a, a strong local demand for fine wines, because you're quite a way away from the city. So I'm thinking, what I'm thinking is that, that if there is that demand for fine wines from, from the Finger Lakes, then then that will encourage people to start finding those sites and then doing the right things with them. Because this, this Pinot Noir is, is, is really, you know, you say it's challenging to grow Pinot Noir there, but this is a beautiful wine and it's, a, it's, it's certainly mature. It's almost six years old, um, but it's got freshness. It's got precision. It's got complexity. It's got this slight silkiness to the fruit, but also this, this, this dry, spicy structure that, that is in a really nice place at the moment. And then there's beautiful hints of, of, of maybe undergrowth and pepper and, 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 and it's just a delightful wine. And I think that's really very exciting. The, the, those last elements are from my uh, slightly excessive use of stems in this wine, um, which is why it's taken me six years to decide to release it. A hundred percent stem usage in Pinot is probably a little too much here. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think the other thing that you missed is the immense amount of phenomenally or potentially phenomenal sites that aren't planted at all because they're hard to work. And I think historically, as farmers growing fruit, we've looked for good patches of dirt to put our vines in. And that that goes, I think we all know that that goes in many ways, slightly counterintuitive to what we know about growing good wine. And so I think that there's a ton of land here that has been deemed too rocky or too steep or too hard to work that has the potential to not grow good fruit, but to grow phenomenal wine. So I think that there's, there's, just, there's so much that we haven't discovered yet. And I think that as we keep experimenting, whether we're talking about, you know, the, the Saparavis and the Arcazzatelli's, whether we're talking about the Zweigelts and the Blaufrankisches, whether we're talking about, I don't think anybody's planted Zinfandel yet, thank God, but like what, whatever, whatever it is, I, I just look forward to finding out or to giving things chances that they haven't been given here before because I think we have opportunity to grow great. Wait, you will be happy to sit here. We have a row of Nebbiolo in the ground. <laughs> no. You still won't plant Syrah for me? God, come on, Oscar. We have planted Syrah for you, my friend. 
<laughs> no, but 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 <laughs> no, but I think just to add a little bit uh, here to we are, we're as a region we're about forty. If, Megan, you guys are fifty years into it or more into vinifera planting, but forty is still very young, and we are exactly what you said here, Jamie. We, it's it we're changing now. We even here at Weimar we are ripping things up turning vine vineyards east west instead of north south really looking into management it's it's not only climate climate change but it's also our knowledge of the land i mean we're figuring things out we have uh we've realized hey 40 years ago why the, why the hell do we plant riesling here when it should be cab franc facing east west or lemberger or i mean we are doing a lot of things at the moment and back to that as we didn't mention, but we have a nursery where we do a lot of experimentation. We're looking at other mountain varieties around the world, uh, what grows in Northern Italy or Austria or in Switzerland. So we have a few of those experiments in the ground too, but also, or just fine tuning what you're doing. Plant density, for example. We, we, we planted vineyards in the seventies with six, seven, eight feet in between because that's how the hybrid were planted. And now they have these like giant bushes for overproducing. And they're like, this is because not- Because our soils are so right? weak. So we're manning. The <laughs> because we need so, bigger. But, but, so it, there's a lot of things, it's exciting things going on. And again, we're very, yes, we're very up and coming. There's a lot of changes happening as we speak. Christopher, um, one question, two questions from, from the um, audience. One is, what are your typical yields per acre for Pinot Noir? Um, and secondly, what clones do you use? Ah, it's probably a better question for Oscar or Megan, to be honest. Um, I, see, uh, I see Pinot being grown anywhere up to, I mean, I've, I've heard people bragging about getting 13 tons to the acre. Whoa, uh, is, that's like that's like 28 or 29 tons a hectare. No, and, no. Uh, where are you, my friend? <laughs> but I think in general, when we look at quality Pinot Noir being grown here, we're looking at three, four tons an acre. Does that seem about right? Yeah, when I think it is, yeah. again, has to do with the, uh, some of these soil. I mean, we didn't talk about soil differences. And Megan, you have maybe a lot of information about this. Uh, the vigor of the soil but yeah around three tons per acre would be maybe a little higher when you do sparkling and then a little lower for for still wine i would say on pinot but pinot is again that's challenging on the rieslings you will get up uh, in the in the four plus range tons per acre gewurz demeanor is lower than that uh clone wise again Again, uh, uh, historically, it's been a little random what clones we're using here. 115777 has been some clones. I think we're getting a little savvier on clone selection also. Um, and now not doing, going into making, having burgundy clones versus uh, champagne clones. Uh, but that's, again, ever evolving. Megan, I mean, what do you have what do you, what do you, you, uh, you had a little history here, so you have a, probably a little more specific. Your pinot yeah, no, definitely. I think it, it depends on the soil and then also the rootstock is really important. You know, for us with the very acidic soils, um, you hear a lot 3309 is a big one in the Finger Lakes, but that does not work for us in the shale portion of, of the west side of Cuca. So SO4 is sort of a weird one that actually you guys at Weimar are helping us with some custom plantings that are I going in, which is tap root. So it cuts down a little bit. Yes. So that yeah. That's right. Yeah, but very helpful to have, you know, these, you know, neighbors and colleagues to to help and and continue on. And and as Christopher and Oscar were mentioning, you know, we're sort of limitless right now. There's so much to experiment um, between really honing in on different rootstocks, different clones, different varieties, different sites. You know, as Christopher was mentioning, we're essentially in a forest here. So we have a lot of very big old trees and certainly the expense of you know cutting down those trees making the land 
uh, you know, workable is certainly an obstacle for probably some of the best sites in the region. So there, there's wonderful things to come. Um, but yeah, certainly Pinot, you know, mutates um, more than, than most varieties. So we have, I think, seven different clones on the property that are just sort of a slew of different generations and different times. But um, no, there's certainly a lot of research that needs to continue. So I think historically, champagne clones were what was originally planted here back in the day, right? Like the first plantings of Pinot, I think, were all champagne clone. And then we saw, was it Maria Felder is the, is the German clones? Mm -hmm. And then eventually yeah. then the, the 2000s, everybody started to plant the Burgundy clones. And now yeah. I think it's going, I mean, right. I don't know. I just, well, it's a small little industry. We all, we all buy shit from each other. So like, I just bought a bunch of clones from Oscar or from, from the Weimer folk last year. And I think I planted 12 clones of Pinot or something that I got from you guys. Just that many. Okay. Around. Yeah, I think, but historically go back to where we were actually a sparkling region before. So mm -hmm. when uh, Guy DeVaux and Charles Fournier of the world, that was their reference to Pinot when they found these protected sites where they started to experiment with Vinifera, especially, uh, you know, I know the Standing Stone site and even up and in, in further up north and on the west side, that, that would, where that comes from. And also what materials was available, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, some of these, uh, the material, those grafting, they, they came through baker truck through, through Canada. We got what we got. So that's another thing, again, going back to why we are looking at reinventing a few things. It's actually the material bank to have, do we have the right clones on the right rootstock at the right soil? That will change a lot. And how do we plant it and how do we manage it? So okay, guys, just to interject again, um, we're running out of time which has been, it's been a fantastic discussion. And I've really, really enjoyed chatting with you. And um, the time has just disappeared very quickly. Um, but I think in, out of respect to our audience, um, I think we need to close it now. And I'm, I just want to thank you very much for your contributions. And, and it's just so lovely to end on this really positive note um, that there's a lot more to come yet. There is indeed. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Thank you to our panel. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, we hope that you'll join us next week uh, or next month, excuse me, on May 12th as we continue the series uh, with an episode focusing on one of New York's flagship grape varieties, Riesling, uh, with host Felicity Carter. So again, that's May 12th, so please mark your calendars. And also a recording of today's webinar will be sent to all of you attendees for you to view later on and reference in the future. So thank you all again and wishing you all a safe and enjoyable week.